glad to have you in our in the worship service today. We're doing a series entitled Messy Life, and uh, we are uh, continuing that series, and it's on the life of Jacob, and it's in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, so if you want to begin turning there in your Bibles, we'll, we'll begin there in, in just a moment. But before we begin, I want to ask you this question. Did you have a, a wedding blooper? What was it? <laughs> fell in the offering plate. You fell in the offering plate? Yeah, I was playing guitar, and I stood up in my row, and I fell in the offering plate. <laughs> <laughs> that was your wedding? Or was my husband's wedding? Okay, uh, that would, that's a good blooper. <laughs> <laughs> someone else, did someone else have a blooper in your wedding? Okay, well. He left the ring at home. <laughs> Lord, 
there are places in your word that challenge us and our belief and our faith and our understanding of who you are. So Lord, we ask that you would help us this morning as we share this time together, as we think about messy lives, and Lord, we thank you that you are in the business of redeeming us, even in the messiness of our lives. So Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. We ask your blessings upon this time. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. When God began his work in the world, actively his redemptive work in the world, he did so by, by making a covenant with one person. That was Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. And to Abraham, God said, I will make you a great nation. I will be your God and you will be my people. And through you, all the world will be blessed. And so in essence, Abraham, I said Andrew, that's our son-in-law. Abraham said, I do. And so there was that covenant created by God with Abraham that would eventually lead to, as we look back in history, led to the birth of Jesus Christ and the birth of the Messiah, who would bless the world. And so, uh, as we move through what's called the Abrahamic Covenant, that covenant passed from Abraham down to his son, who was, you know your Bible history, Isaac. That's where we are in Genesis 25 right now. Uh, Isaac married Rebekah. Rebekah had um, two children, Esau and Jacob. So with that, look at your, look at your Bibles. To Genesis 25, verse 23. The little backstory here is that, that uh, within the womb of Rebecca, there is the jostling of two, uh, of two boys. And she prays and asks God about this thing that was going on within her. And so this is God's answer to Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So there's, there's the covenant that God had made with Abraham that passed from Abraham to his son Isaac, and from Isaac down to one, one of his sons. But which one? So here we're told simply that there, uh, that there are two boys in her womb one will be, uh, one will serve the other. The older will serve the younger. Well, here's the elephant in the room. And it's not in the story here. It's actually a little bit later in your Bibles. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says this. And also Romans 9, 13 says this. Jacob I love. Esau, I hate. Jacob, I loved. Esau, I hate. That's troubling. We all grew up with the understanding that God is love, right? Um, and in uh, the New Testament, Paul writes that nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither. Neither life nor death or angels, principalities, things present, things to come. No created thing in all of creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are the verses that we stake our life on. And then we read something like this, and it rattles our cage. It's troubling. It's troubling for me when I read it. I really wanted to bypass that passage. I really didn't have to deal with it because it's not right here in Genesis 25, but I was thinking, okay, if somebody in the future reads this, uh, they go back, well, why didn't we kind of touch on that one? <laughs> and it may be the elephant in the room. It's something that's there that we really don't want to talk about, but I think we need to. So that's, that's where we're headed today. If you look at the Malachi passage, one thing, thing you, you'll notice, if you read closely, you'll see that, that the writer of Malachi is not speaking of two 
separate individuals, but he is talking about two people groups. Edom, which, which is the descendants of Esau, and Israel, which is, who are the descendants of Jacob. He's not talking specifically about two specific individuals, but he's talking about two people groups. Does that make that any better? Not necessarily, it doesn't. So what is what does he mean when he says Esau, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it? Go back to the, the illustration that we used at the very beginning when we talked about marriage bloopers and us and us entering into that covenant with, with our spouse. We are in essence forsaking all others in order to to have this covenant relationship with our spouse. So if you think about what God was doing in bringing the Messiah into the world, there could only be one choice through that lineage. So when you go back to Abraham, there's actually Abraham, uh, uh, but there's actually Isaac and who else? Ishmael. Remember, he was born to Hagar. But God said, no, the covenant's going to be from you and Sarah. So then it came to, so did, did God hate Ishmael by choosing Isaac? We don't think so. So when you come to Esau and Jacob, does it mean that here in Genesis 25, did, does it mean that God hated Esau, therefore he rejected him and chose Jacob at that time? Is that how we look at it? I don't think so. At least I don't. And I don't think it's in keeping with Wesleyan theology either. The, uh, the, uh, the idea of divine election where God chooses some and does not choose others. And in God choosing some, then some are just left to be destroyed. That's not our theology. Also, Wesley believed that the idea of divine election or divine choice was, was contrary to the very nature of God. And I think we would probably not have in agreement with that. Because what do you do with verses like John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And where, and where Jesus says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whoever... So, so here where we read that, that uh, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated, does it really mean that God hated Esau? I don't think so. When you look at God's covenant love and devotion and care for Israel, everything else pales. Because he had, God had the one design of bringing one into the world that would redeem the whole world. And so therefore his love and his, his care, his affection, his attention was given fully to Israel. But not to the, not to the point of rejecting from his love all others. Just like you in your covenant relationship with your spouse. Your, the, your love and affection toward your spouse, when compared to your love for others, pales in comparison. It's difficult. So it leads us to the question, does God hate? Does God hate? Look at, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs is really easy to find. You find uh, uh, Psalms, the very middle of your Bible, flip toward the back of your Bible to Pro Proverbs chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. Six, fifteen through 
19. Verse 16. There are six things the Lord hates. Does God hate? Obviously he does. What are the things that he hates? We have them summarized on the slides up here. Look what he says. Haughty eyes, lying tongues, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that, that devises wicked schemes, feet that rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and one who stirs up conflict in the community. Six things. Pretty clear. Do we find it troubling that, God, that the scriptures say that there are things that God hates? We might. But in a way, we can look at it and say, well, that's good information to have. Right? Because, because if I want to live, if we want to live lives that are pleasing to God, we want to know the things that displeases Him. And so there we have a list. These are things that I need to stay away from as a child of God. These are things I need to give attention to if I am, if I do have a tendency toward these things. Does that mean God hates me? No, it's meant to bring us to repentance. That we might confess those things. That we might experience transformation. That we might experience new life. God hates anything that mars the image, His image within us. And these things in Proverbs mar His image within us. So those are the things that God Hates, despises, dislikes, everybody you want to praise it. So, getting back to our verse that we read this morning, verse 23. There was one covenant, and that one covenant could only go to one son. Jesus couldn't have been born. The lineage of Jesus could not have included Esau and Jacob. Just from a sheer genetic standpoint, right? So there had to be one of those that was chosen to be the lineage of the covenant, and one was not. So, why Jacob and not Esau? Was Jacob more righteous than Esau? As we, as we move along in the, in the story, you'll find that he was not. As a matter of fact, he was probably a little worse than Esau. We'll learn that Jacob uh, lied to his father. Jacob also implicated God in a lie in order to treat his father. But what did Esau do? Esau despised his birthright. There was something in Esau... Uh, there, there was obviously something in Esau's heart that caused him to turn away from this relationship that could have been his. That's scary. We're going to be talking about in the next few weeks ways that we can guard our hearts. So was there something in Esau's heart that caused him to deny his birthright? But on to this idea of, hate, of God hating things. God's divine hatred is actually an expression of God's holiness. Divine hatred is an expression of God's holiness. How so? How can, could, could God be holy and just and pure and righteous and not hate murder, sexual abuse, rape? The list goes on and on. Does this stand to be logical that God would hate certain things? If God is holy and just and pure. So God, God hating those things actually confirms God's holiness and purity. And, and the same is true for us. 
When we see things that are deplorable and, and, and evil and we are appalled at it, that is, in a sense, an, exp an expression of God's, God's image within us. Because we see something and we are repelled by it. And Paul, would it stand a reason that God, who is so much more holier, the holy other, would it stand a reason that he too would be Paul and sick? John chapter 14 is another place where, where we read about what I think is, is God's covenant to us. In John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus is uh, speaking of the Holy Spirit in that section of Scripture. And here in verse 21, he says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So how do we know if we love God? Are we keeping his commands? Next, the next sentence in that verse is this. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. Does that mean that we're not loved by the Father if we do not love Christ? I think what it's saying to us is that in, in this covenant relationship, we were brought into a divine and unique relationship with God the Father through the Son. And it's a love for human need that surpasses all understanding. Does that mean that God does not love the world? No, it does not. But what it does mean is that you and I are the objects of a unique and divine sort of love that's brought to us through this covenant of Christ's body and His blood shed for us. And when we come to faith and trust in Him, we are brought into that unique relationship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. A love that is unique in all the world. Yes, God loves Yes, God loves Esau. But in that covenant relationship, he has chosen to lavish his love on us through the son that he loves. As we put out as we put out into the deep, you may be thinking, well, how do I know that I'm in the covenant? How do, I, how do I know? This is from uh, Psalm uh, 51, 17. And this is what I believe from, from Jacob's life and, and Esau's life. And it's this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. What's the key? our relationship with Jesus Christ and the love of God, our repentance, our repentance. Is my heart bent toward Him? Not that it's perfect, or is my heart completely bent all the way from God? God chooses the repentant. The elephant in the room
but we also to thank you for your word that tells us that, that even while we're still far away from you, that Christ died for us, demonstrating his love for us. Father, we, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for this time to be together. We ask your blessings upon this time in the name of Christ our Lord.